Hi, everyone. Right. Good afternoon. Right. On a rainy sort of day in London and thinking that it's nice that we're not traveling because it's really, really wet outside. And it, we're fortunate that despite the pandemic, we can still do this online. So welcome back to Arabic story, uh, Arabic poetry and story in translation workshops. Uh, we didn't have any last year. Uh, but we're coming back, even though online, we hope that, you know, online would give us a different kind of reach. Um, so this is a series of uh, Arabic poetry and translation workshops that, that started with Marina's idea, and I joined her. Um, and we have been collaborating for a period of a few years now, mainly because we are both very passionate about literature, but more importantly, we're passionate about literature. And we believe that we can learn a lot about the world, about who we are, and about how we are connected through reading each other's literature. Uh, but fundamentally, it is also about opening a space for dialogue amongst word literatures, amongst word languages, and also between translation and creativity. Uh, we think, right, it's possible to access literary text, uh, an, a new literary world through translation, but also through translation, our life, our thoughts, our languages can be enriched. Um, and as usual, uh, Marina will come in and say a bit more about this in a few seconds, uh, but I will introduce, do my part into introduction and introduce my good, um, how, how would I call Hertian van Gelder, a good friend, an elderly a, a sort of advisor, a sort of like an older brother figure to whom I turn to whenever I have um, questions about Arabic literature, about Arabic language, and particularly about editing, right? And Hertian van Gelder is a Dutch academic and he would like to be known. And he was uh, the Laudian professor of Arabic at the University of Oxford between 1998 and 2012. And he was elected to the British Academy in 2005. He has a long list of publications, right, including Beyond the Line, Classical Arabic Literary Criticism uh, on the Coherence of Unity of the Poem, which came out in 1982, of Dishes and Courses, Classical Arabic Literary Representations of Food, which came out in 19, hmm, uh, I don't have a date here, 1999. Um, close relationships, uh, incest, and inbreeding in classical Arabic literature in 2005, sound and sense in classical Arabic poetry, 2012, right? And he's also the editor and translator of classical Arabic literature and a library of Arabic literature anthology, which came out in 2012. And I would like to sort of like introduce you, if you don't know it yet, to the series by uh, the series, the library of Arabic literature, which is a series of edited Arabic texts accompanied by translations into English, but into accessible English by leading scholars in the field. And I chose specifically today's spot here so you can see the whole series behind my back, right? And Hertian's anthology is the first volume of the Library of Arabic Literature. But of course, right, his research ranged a lot more widely, right? It covers uh, sort of like all the topics you can think of that is uh, that are relevant to Arabic poetry, poetics, genres, prose writings, belles lettres, and so forth. But most importantly, he has a keen sense of humor and he has a taste for the uncommon. So when he retired, um, the Arabists among us, when we decided to do a trip in his honor, we chose these topics, the rude, the bad and the body. And you will sort of like see a little bit of that in the exercises he has provided for us. Right, so thank you very much Hartian for coming. Now I turn to Marina to introduce Phil Terry. <laughs> thank you so much, Winjin. And um, the original spirit of the workshops 
were to try, as Winchin said, to open up a conversation between Arabic literature and non-specialists in Arabic, as well as specialists in Arabic. And I couldn't be more happy that Phil Terry, who is a poet and translator of great ingenuity and breadth, has joined this workshop because he is an expert in Oulipo. Oulipo, the ouvroir de littérature potentielle, the workshop for potential literature. He will tell you more about it. But what is interesting about this experimental and playful approach to generating stories and texts is that it corresponds to quite a number of approaches that are found in earlier Arabic literature. So we thought it would be very, which Girtian has specialized in. So we thought it would be interesting to put these two voices together because the spirit of our workshops is comparative uh, above all and about translation as a diachronic conversation between cultures and languages, not, not simply a transposition of one text into the world of another, but a much more organic process. And Phil, amongst his many publications, has actually worked on Dante, and he's done a version of the Inferno, which I highly recommend to you. And he's also done a version of Gilgamesh, which is called Dictator, and is written in the language of Globish, which is the business speak language, international business speak language. So first we're going to go to the Geert Jan. Uh, well, thank you, Marina, for introduction, and especially for also your kind words mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm aware that, of course, the level of Arabic knowledge amongst you is rather varied. varied. So some things I will say will be, be known to many of you, and other things may be too technical, but I hope you uh, will bear with me. So, um, yeah, um, the phrase, the paradoxical freedom of constraints was chosen by Marina, and it's very apt when you talk about classical Arabic poetry. Constraints are part and parcel of Arabic literature, and of poetry in particular. In addition to being required to use a somewhat artificial construct called classical Arabic, with, with its complex grammar and gigantic lexicon, a poet is bound by the strict prosodical rules, uh, quantitative metrics of some 12 or more meters with their variants, and by the custom of using monorhyme in the more prestigious forms uh, of poetry, whether the poem has two or four lines or uh, 100. In fact, um, there is one didactic, rather boring poem on Islamic religion from the 14th century um, that has 5,842 verses in Camel meter rhyming in Annie. Almost unbelievable. It's true that rhyming in Arabic is much easier than in English. In fact, some poets found it a bit too easy and imposed on themselves a kind of rich rhyme involving two consonants instead of one. A technique known as luzum malayazam, being bound by what is not binding or a self-imposed constraint. It is indeed something of a paradox that poetry with its prosodical constraints is the medium that offers a much greater freedom in terms of content. For, in it, for it is in poetry rather than prose that traditionally one may with impunity flout the religious duty, duties of Islam, uh, say that one does not observe Ramadan, drink lots of wine, fornicate with male and female loved ones, lampoon friends and foes for fun or in earnest. Now here is a, a general statement for you. The ultimate freedom consists in willingly imposing constraints upon oneself. Discuss. But this workshop is about forms of wordplay and further of imposed restrictions in Arabic. Now, even before Marina Warner told me that she would inv invite Philip Terry to this event, I had already acquired his recent uh, wonderful collection. And of course, he uh, will talk about it. This is the back, he'll, he'll explain the, the back cover perhaps himself later. Um, the uh, Penguin Book of Ulipo is, uh, is, is a wonderful collection. I've long been an admirer of Ulipo. And uh, of course, as you know, the movement produces texts subject to certain constraints with results that are often startling, funny, baffling, or plain silly. Uh, some of the constraints are ancient and were practiced by the ancient Greeks, such as the lipogram, which means, of course, not using certain letters of the alphabet. Uh, there is a 19th century English poem, poem called Eve's Legend that does that. Um, there are texts avoiding the letter E in uh, various languages. For instance, uh, the famous novel La Disparition by Georges Perec, translated faithfully into English without the letter E by Gilbert Adair as Avoid, avoid. That's a brilliantly punning title. Now, classical Arabic literature abounds in similar forms of playing with language and texts. In English, wordplay and punning always imply a contrast with seriousness. 
This does not always work in Arabic, where such play is often very serious. The structure of the very language in invites punning, which is better given serious technical terms such as uh, paranomasia or figura etymologica or double entendre, etc. Uh, self imposed constraints such as the lipogram are not always forms of playing. Uh, for instance, there's a report that the uh, theologian Wasil ibn al who died about 750, uh, was unable to properly pronounce the r. So he avoided it in his speeches and sermons. We have some examples of his text, which may not be authentic, but certainly old. Wasil was helped by the enormous lexicon of classical Arabic, so that talking about rain, for instance, he could say raith instead of the more normal word matar. Uh, still, it would have been a serious handicap for a theologian, a theologian being unable to pronounce Quran or to say Ramadan or the customary opening formula Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Anyhow, um, a treasure trove of only poetic techniques in Arabic. After 50 short narratives called Maqamat, in very ornate rhymed prose interspersed with poetry written by Al-Hariri, who died in 1122. Now, recently, a translation, I use this uh, advisedly, of this very famous work appeared. Michael Cooperson, he called his work The Impostures, is, that's a brilliant, dazzling and very witty work, but I would not call it a translation, and it only gives a faint idea, oh, she's called it, I call it here, so of course, it, it gives, gives only a faint idea of the original Arabic, which admittedly is almost impossible to translate. There exist a couple of English renderings that are faithful to the sense, but they are not an easy read and need lots of annotation to explain all the puns and the allusions. Now, Cooperson decided to follow, in a sense, Raymond Cuneau's exercice in using 50 different kinds or styles of English for the 50 narratives, such as the styles of Chaucer, Samuel Johnson, Gertrude Stein, the jargon of psychologists, uh, the slang of Californian students, Singlish, which is English spoken in Singapore, Spanglish, and so on. It's all very clever, and I warmly recommend reading his impostures, but it's very different from Al-Hariri, who used only one form of Arabic in all his 50 maqamat. Cooperson's impostures is not a translation, it is itself a brilliant imposture, and it tells you far more about today's Singapore or California than about Baghdad in 1100. It contains a lot of Cooperson and very little Ahari. This is just a warning. It should have been published not in the Library of Arabic Literature, but in the Library of English Literature. Ahari's book contains palindromes and metrical verses that can be read forwards and backwards, and passages that are specific forms of lipograms, such as passages only containing only dotted letters or only undotted letters, or passages in which words with only dotted letters alternate with undotted words, and so on. Uh, it's all very technical and very clever. Cooperson, in his impostures, in his turn, exploited a feature of the Latin alphabet when he wrote a passage using only letters without ascenders or descenders, you know, the bits that stick out on top or below, like you can't use a B or a D or a, a J, for instance. Such wordplay, by the way, is based on writing on the eye. It appeals to the eye rather than the ear. Uh, Hariri also composed two epistles, um, in one of them, each word contains the letter scenes, and in the other, each word contains a sheen, impossible to imitate in English, of course. And both are moreover written in rhymed prose. I'll just give you uh, the sound of one of these letters, which is, uh, I'm not going to translate it. <laughs> And it goes on and on and on like that. So I shall not attempt to translate it. Now, Hariri was followed by many, and he was out hariri in terms of artistry and linguistic exuberance by the 13th century Ibn Saikal, whose maqamat are even more artful. Uh, but it was certainly Hariri who popularized such techniques in Arabic. But they are found much earlier. Uh, a chapter of the anthology Zahra, the Flower, by the poet Ibn Dawood al Isbahani, who died in 910, has a rhyming title, uh, one chapter, Dhikr al Shahr al Yustadraf li Khuruji an Had Yuraf, which may be rendered as uh, poetry that is deemed curious because it goes beyond what is conventionally known. Now, here too, we find lithograms, poems that use only undotted letters or only dotted letters, 
or dotted ones in the first half of the line and undotted letters in the second half, etc. Um, nicely, there are very nicely uh, pointless exercises. So the pun comes quite naturally. And he offers also panadromes. In fact, I'm now going to try, I'm rather experienced in these matters, but we have, actually, we have uh, tried before to share a text with you. Okay, so I will go to the first example, which is the palindrome. You should realize, of course, that um, it does not work with the sounds, but only with letters, with the written letters. So that's why I have given the transliteration, which, of course, um, basically only the consonants. Uh, it actually means something, uh, unlike most palindromes in English. Um, I see the women have been boon companions of his during nights of pleasure. Have their nights come close to being like days? So, well, something meaning. Um, there are also pangrams, which, of course, uh, are utterances, sentences in Arabic, and usually verses that contain all the letters of the alphabet. Um, the next one is, uh, well, it's a bit of a tongue twister. Sif halqa hawdin kamithli shamsi iz batharat. Ya hawa daji'u biha najla'u ma'ataru, which means something like... Uh, Describe the body of a young woman like the sun when it rises, wide-eyed, fragrant, with whom her bedfellow is favoured. Well, to me, it makes more sense than the most famous pangram in English about a quick brown fox that jumps over a lazy dog. And moreover, moreover it is in metrical verse, but I must admit, it has more superfluous letters. It would be nice if the attribution to Al Khalil ibn Ahmad were correct in the late 8th century, for he is the compiler of the first Arabic dictionary and the one who first described the system of Arabic poetic meters. Um, the Penguin Book of Ulipo, by the way, contains an English pangram of 26 letters, believe it or not, without any superfluous letters, a tour de force by Ian Monk, only possible after a two-page preparatory introduction. I recommend reading it. Um, back to this chapter by Ibn Dawood, who died in 910. He uh, quotes verses only using only unconnected letters, uh, that is using only six of the 26 of 28 letters of the alphabet, a short acrostic poem and poems that heap particular letters, such as a line with 11 instances of the sound, com combining alliteration with etymological paranomasia. And that is my third example. Um, something like confer on your friend be sincere with sincere sincerity and favor your friend with friendship then you will also be favored it's relatively easy to translate this with some of the same profusion of similar consonants as i did now the earliest example of arabic lipogram known to me dates from the 8th century very early the poet ibn harma who died around 792 or so is said to have composed a poem of 40 lines without dotted letters only 12 lines are preserved and Normally, one could argue that such lipograms are pointless unless a deeper sense is connected with them, as some people think is the case with uh, Perex la disparition, the book without the E. I may come back to this later. But this is not so, in, for instance, uh, Haridi's lipograms. But the poem by Ibn Harma, and I give the first line on the bottom of my first uh, page, um, because Ibn, Harma poem, Ibn Harma's poem is different, for the poem contains a clear hint at the lipo lipogrammatic nature of the text already in its opening lines. And there the absence is thematically very significant. As so often in classical Arabic odes, the poem opens with a nostalgic or elegiac passage uh, describing an abandoned encampment in the desert where the poet once was united with his beloved. The traces of Sauda, a woman's name, are they a barren place, its remains effaced, made devoid, turned by changing times as if into mantles? I'm not quite sure of the image of these mantles, perhaps mantles that have been worn down. But the word traces, rasm, also means the writing or the shape of the word, regardless of its diacritic dots. Barren, mahal, effaced, that is, and made devoid, all refer to the absence of the black dots. Sauda, the name, is of course related to sauda, black, and a substance, a substantive noun, sauda, could mean valley full of black stones, which you focus the black dots on the page. So the lipogrammatic form is therefore to be connected with the content, which would please those literary critics who like such a link. 
this is very much uh, an exception. And usually no attempts are made or to an uh, organic unity or whatever one calls this of form and content. Uh, I don't find that a problem. Such a uh, some word play is based on homonymy, the sounding alike of two or more words. Uh, in English, for instance, the sound C stands for the letter C, the verb to see, the watery C, the C as in the holy C, the musical note C that follows la, and one could throw in the French or Spanish C, of course. In Arabic, the most notorious word is khal. There's a poem in monorhyme of 16 lines, all ending in el khali, which each with a different meaning. And among these meanings are maternal uncle, mole or beauty spot, banner, suspicion, good token, cloud giving no rain, haughtiness, black stallion, camel, uh, stallion camel, owner of a thing. I shall not get them all. Uh, one can make puns with words or sentences that differ only in their diacritic dots. This is my fifth example, and it's the next page. Um, for instance, Hulf el Wahad, Hulf el Wahad. I've given the translation. You can see from the Arabic that it looks alike apart from the dots, which means something like breaking one's promise is the trait of a scoundrel. And this may, it may take the form of a riddle, as the far more complicated and rather contrived number six. Uh, it really says, Jandal uh, was Sadaf Bull. Uh, the boulder and the oyster shell are wet. Doesn't mean anything, but you must reread it as Al uh, Hub Dhul or Sad Katl. Loving is humiliation, and lover's aloofness is, is killing, is, uh, it will kill you. And word divisions have to ignore it. I uh, give a, a well, there's a, the, the procedure you have to follow. You have to rewrite it without dots and then add dots. And this is extremely contrived, but they did it a lot. And I should also mention the, the chronocrime, of course which makes use of the fact that every letter in the Arabic alphabet has a numerical value, unlike Latin script, where only a few letters do, of course. It usually occurs in a verse or hemistic at the end of a poem. And I have given one example, my number seven, by the famous poet and Sufi Abd al in Nebulusi, who died in the 18th century, on someone called Muhammad. And it means glory said in a chronogram, I am honored by Muhammad. And I've given you the, uh, the, the, the method, uh, arithmetic as well. So this was written in 1075 of the uh, Muslim era. Um, so again, it should be obvious that most of these techniques cannot properly be translated. Either one gives the literal sense of a pangram or lipogram or palindrome while losing what makes them special, or one replaces them with English equivalents, losing the literal meaning. In general, translators can move between extremes, like, for instance, that of uh, Vladimir Nabokov in his translation of Pushkin's Anigin, which is so literal to be awkward as to be awkward, and in Nabokov's own words, even not ugly enough, ignoring meter and rhyme, for instance. And the other extreme being that of, for instance, Douglas Hofstadter, uh, who says that making unrhymed translations of rhyming originals is daffy or bonkers, I quote his terms. Nabokov was surely misguided in his enterprise, but his method may be useful in academic translations as a crib. And Hofstadter's dogma will not work with Arabic poetry. I normally make myself translations that are someone in, in between. Um, in England, it's customary to groan upon hearing a poem, especially a good one. Now, few, pe few people read the poems of Th Thomas Hood, who died in 1845, one of my favorite 19th century English poets, the master of puns. The pre-modern Arabic poets, both high and low, had no qualms about using puns. And there's an abundance of punning, especially in poetry, discussed and subdivided in great detail in numerous medieval works on stylistics. Many different kinds of paranomasia are distinguished, and especially in the Manrak and following periods, and uh, poets and stylisticians were extremely fond of tauria, which, do, which is du blanc tendre, based on homonymy. Puns did not have a low status and are by no means always meant to be funny. That is clear from the fact that they are frequent, for instance, in mystical poetry, and they may be found in heartfelt elegies on relatives and friends. Um, translating puns is often said to be impossible, but I've sometimes replaced an Arabic pun with an English one. And uh, I give uh, an example in number eight, by a 14th century poet, Ibn Nubata, who laments his, the death of his wife. So it's not a funny pun, it's meant to be serious. Now he uses various words that have ordinary meanings, but also tech, our technical terms in grammar and syntax. 
such as hat, hat, which means conjunction, but also sympathy and inclination. Neda, which means calling, or call, but also vocative. And nat, which means description, but also attribute or adjective. So that's my eighth example. So a literal version would be a young woman. I once had her tender sympathy, but the only thing left to me now is calling her and describing her. Instead of lino atfiha, you could also read lino atfiha, perhaps the softness of her body. Perhaps this additional pun is also intended. Now, much my translation is, fo is as follows replacing Arab Arabic grammatical terms with English ones and hoping the reader will be aware of the connection between conjugal and conjugation. A young sweet woman conjugated with me once, she now remains declined to me. I've grown if you like. Um, using Arabic grammatical terms in punning, often Schaber's verse and senses uh, was very popular as it was in European literature. Now for the exercises part of this event a bit later, I have selected a few more of such punning anagrams, epigrams with double entendre. Uh, I've chosen bits where I myself have found solutions of a kind. And there is one early poetic technique, finally, that lends itself more easily to translation, the stylistic exercises made famous by Raymond, Raymond Queneau. And I intend to devote my talk in the public part of this workshop later today to the Arabic precursors, or what Olympians call anticipatory plagiarisms of Queneau's exercisisti. Um, but for the workshop, which will follow later, you have been sent six examples of classical Arabic wordplay, all taken from poetry, with a request to attempt the impossible, to translate puns. Um, I've just made my own translations, and I am curious to see what, we'll, what you will turn up with. So I've done my bits at first. Uh, over to you, Phil, I suppose. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. That, I mean, I, I, I come here as, as, as a someone very interested in Arabic literature, but, but um, my knowledge of it is, is um, slight. And uh, it's already been a fantastic education to me listening to your brilliant talk um, here at Jan. So I'm here to say something about um, Ulipo and thanks to Marina and Soas for asking me to take part in this event, which we were planning about a year ago. And it's, it's, it's wonderful, it's actually now taking place. Um, so what sparked this? as you know, no, is the perhaps unexpected um, but absolute consonance that can be found between certain writings in Arabic and, and uh, writings from uh, Ulipo, who are often thought of as sort of avant-garde group, but actually they're very interested in traditional literature as, as, as well. Um, so you've heard some examples, some magnificent examples of wordplay and pangrams and so forth, um, in Arabic, and I'll tell you something about um, Ulipo now, and it's Ulipo's concept of constraint, and then hopefully in the discussion that follows, we can we can put all of this together, which should be interesting. Um, so here I'm, I'm pitching myself at the complete beginner uh, with um, Ulipo. Here are, here's a list of, this is a very Ulipian thing to do in itself, actually, to, to do it in numbers. 10 things you need to know about Ulipo. So number one, Ulipo was founded in 1960. Um, so this year marks its 61st birthday, which makes it the longest lasting literary group in France. It stands for um, Ouvoir de Littérature Potentielle, or Workshop as, of Potential Literature, as it is usually translated. This would give it the clumsy acronym of WOPOLI in English, which is why even in English people stick to ULIPO, which rolls off the tongue much better, much better, a bit like Lolita. We had a reference to Nabokov earlier, Ulipo. Um, two, in case you think workshop of potential literature sounds too gallically solemn, it's worth noting that one of the connotations of ouvroir in French is a knitting circle. Um, and some members are happy with this. It suggests a group of people muddling along with what they like to do best, which is uh, making and sharing their ideas. It also conjures up the scene of people sitting around and telling stories as in the Brothers Grimm or the Thousand and One Nights. Three, Ulipo is most frequently thought of as a group who devise constraints for literary use. The most famous of these, which um, here Jan has already mentioned, is the lipogram from Greek 
lip to omit and grammar letter, where you write something without using certain letters. And Ulipo did not invent this. There were lipograms in ancient Greek and in early biblical texts. Um, but the form was made famous by uh, Georges Perec, who wrote the novel we've already heard a little bit about, La Disparition, which came out in 1969, translated into English as, as, as A Void by Gilbert Adair in 1994, where there are no E's. I mean, the literal translation of La Disparition would, of course, be The Disappearance, which already has three E's in it. So, it, so even the title, you have to sort of twist it a little bit. And La Disparition and A Void have, have slightly different connotations, obviously. Four, if this sounds trivial, it isn't. In Ulipo, there should always be some reason for the constraint, or ideally, there should be some reason for the constraint. There isn't always when Ulipo are just messing around, but in the, in, in the uh, more significant works of literature, there's, there's usually a reason. Um, in French, the letter E, uh, is a homophone for uh, E-U-X, or they, which in France in the Second World War was the term used to refer to those who disappeared to the death camps, which including uh, Perec's own mother. Uh, that, so that the Holocaust, in a sense, is the secret theme of this novel. Uh, five, if this looks eccentric, um, Ulipo would say it isn't either. Ulipo are quick to point out that all literature involves constraints. Uh, plays typically have five acts, novels are divided into chapters, sonnets usually have 14 lines and so on. Ulipo use all these traditional forms, but their distinction is perhaps that they try and invent new ones as well as discover and reuse old ones. And this relates to what I see as Ulipo's fundamental generosity. When they devise constraints, they don't keep them to themselves. Um, they make them available to people outside Ulipo to use if they want to do so. Um, six, where Ulipo and constraints are concerned, um, historically it helps to think of Ulipo as reacting against uh, surrealism. Surrealism concept of automatic writing or automatism involves the subject entering a quasi dreamlike state and writing whatever the pen feels like writing without the intervention of conscious thought. Cano, who had for a period been a member of the Surrealists, though he fell out rather violently with um, André Breton, the, the leader of the Surrealists. Cano wasn't the only person to fall out with uh, Breton. Um, but um, Cano argued that the products of surrealism were often, in literature in particular, were often very samey. Uh, true freedom, Cano concludes, um, resided in form, in, in what you could see as a return to neoclassicism, in constraint rather than in the apparent total freedom of the surrealist method. Um, paradoxically, some, some Ulipian um, techniques lead one to, to write texts which have a very surrealist flavor, but that's, that's another matter. Seven, we've mentioned the lipogram as an example of an Ulipian constraint. Um, what are some other examples of constraint? Um, to name just three, there are constraints of form. So the kind of thing we also find in Arabic literature and um, such as uh, Jacques Rubo's form, which he calls a trident. I'll show you this in a second. We might even have a go at one. This is a variation on the haiku and it has three lines with a syllable count of five, three, and five. There are constraints um, of letters, such as the lithogram, or one of its variants, um, which has also already been mentioned in relation to impostures, um, where you don't use any letters without ascenders or descenders. Ulipo call this the prisoner's constraint, imagining the situation of a prisoner with limited amounts of paper. So if they just use the letters A, uh, C, E, I, O, et cetera, then they will economize on, on, on paper. And there are constraints of um, time would be another one. So write a novel in a day is something one of the, one of the Olympians, Jacques Jouet has written several of his novels he wrote in sort of novel writing competitions where you had to write a, a novel in a day. Um, or an example drawn from the current uh, poet laureate in this country, Simon Armitage, um, who's written us some poems in the time it takes to burn a match, which is, is, is in a sense an, an Olympian thing. Um, the, the Trident by Jacques Roubaud. Have we got, do you think we can spare a few minutes? I just have a couple more things to say, but I thought 
I'll show you this at least. I thought we might even have a go at writing it because the, the workshop itself will be um, given over to translating Arabic. So here, if I can find it, is one of these tridents by Jacques Roubaud. Here we are, it's number 877. You can see he's written a lot of these. Um, it's got a title of a death and then the, the trident itself is three lines of five syllables three syllables and five syllables. I finger this death in my thoughts. I wipe off the tears. So that, that's, that's a trident. So if, if, if in, at least in the West, the, the um, haiku is generally thought of as interpreted as being five, three lines, five, seven, five syllables. And here Rubo has simply changed the numbers. So he's got, I finger this death five in my thoughts, five, three, five. And there are lots of other examples of this um, sort of recalibrating of the haiku by Ulipo, which is where the, the maths comes into Ulipo. They noticed that with the five, seven, five um, formula, you have five as a prime number, seven as a prime number, five as a prime number, and three, the number of lines is a prime number. And then five plus five plus seven is 17, which is a prime number. So you've got all these prime numbers going around, but if you keep the prime numbers and change the numbers, Ulipo said it's still a haiku because it still obeys those prime number rules. So, so I finger this death in my thoughts, I wipe off the tears is, is an Ulipian haiku, even if it's five, three, five, rather than five, seven, five. Um, we could just stop there and move on. Or if you like, I could give you two minutes in which to try and write one of these little poems using five, three, five. I would suggest you don't aim at, um, don't try and write a brilliant poem, just try and write anything at all through what you can see around you. So I can look out the window and say, the rain is falling. That's my first line, five. So try that. I'll just give you two minutes and see if we can come up with anything. Because we won't be doing Ulipo in the workshop and Ulipo's got one of the important things about it is not just to hear about it but to, to do it so I'll give you two minutes see if anyone can write one of these that's two minutes which wasn't long but did anyone come up with one you could read it out or, or put it in the chat if you like these games tickle me can I play scared to fail must try <laughs> Very good, Marina. I see one from Sarah Ekdawi in the chat, which is perfect. I walk to the door, my cat cries, I give in at once. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and then from Ellie Myerson, there's Pfizer BioNTech. I had it today in the rain, which also Fits the, fits the pattern very well. And from Orhan, the sun is shining in my mind. I am traveling. Yeah, that's also good. And Edmund, they took the handle from my door. Now I can't go out, <laughs> which is, which is a slightly surreal one. And Hannah, you've got the plant grows aside, slight tilt yearning for the light. And I had, what did I have? I can hear the rain outside. So I've got the rain is falling. It's Friday. We're writing tridents. There we are. So now back to where was I? Eight. Eight of my um, brief introduction to Ulipo. Eight. If constraint is the most common definition of what Ulipo do, um, a quick word of warning, they do other things too. Apart from constraints such as the lipogram, um, one of the most famous methods is called N plus seven or S plus seven in French, where you take a text that already exists and change all the nouns by moving on seven places in a dictionary. This will change depending on what dictionary you use. Um, to be or not to be, that is the quiche, for example. This isn't really a constraint, but the method of transformation or translation. And it's been used by lots of writers in English, partly because it's comic and slightly satirical. Uh, including the spoken word poet, the culture spoken word poet, Ross Southern, who has written an N plus seven version of Little Red Riding Hood available on YouTube called Liverish Red Blooded Riff Ruff Hoo Ha. And, and, and it works, it goes all the way through and works really well, I'd recommend it. Um, another thing quite close to this, also a kind of eccentric translation is 
what Ulipo call homophonic translation. And this takes us back to some of the things Hirt Jan was saying about um, um, punning. Homophonic translation is really a, a, kind, of, a kind of punning. Um, an example of this would be the two sentences. I'm not going to be able to explain this, but uh, the sun's rays meet, as in the rays of light coming from the sun in the sky meeting. The sun's rays meet, but also the sons, as in not the daughters, but the, the sons, um, raising, uh, bringing up, um, or, or, or cultivating um, um, meat, as, a, as, a, as, in, as in cattle or beef. So the, sun, so the sons raise meat, or, or the sons raise meat. The, so those are two sentences which are, they sound exactly the same, but they mean different things and, and are written differently. So the, the one is a homophonic translation of the other. And essentially this is a form of extended punning, as you can see, and it's used by Ulipo as by some of its precursors. The eccentric aristocratic French writer Raymond Roussel was famous for making his stories out of this kind of linguistic play. And in its simplest form, he would take two sentences such as the ones I've given you, and then, and then one would be the, one would give him the first sentence of his story, and one would give him the last story, and the, the job of writing would be to connect them. Um, and this kind of extensive punning and wordplay is something which has also appealed to the surrealists. You find it in uh, Robert Desnos, um, who, who invented punning phrases to put in the mouth of Marcel Duchamp's alter ego, uh, Rose C'est la vie, a name which itself is a punning one, Rose C'est la vie, C'est la vie, it's, that's life. Um, and he, he came up with punning sentences like, this is a translation, but it captures it, um, is the solution of a sage, the pollution of a page. And it's also something, as we've seen, which we find in Arabic writings. And it's one of the things which they, which they share. Nine, another thing Ulipo do that isn't really captured by the word constraint is to make a piece of literature by working with permutations or shuffling, shuffling elements of a story or a poem to get new poems. This is something they call permutational literature. And the clearest example of it is a book by founder Raymond Cano called 100 thousand billion poems published in 1961. Here Kuno writes 10 sonnets, but by shuffling the lines in a kind of flip-flap book, you get many more sonnets, and apparently more sonnets than you could in fact read in a lifetime if you, if you were silly enough to actually spend your life reading, reading Kuno's book, which, which soon um, uh, becomes repetitive actually, which was his criticism of surrealism, bizarrely, but it's a delightful book nonetheless. I will illustrate this with a much simpler and easier to follow book of mine, which is also a flip flap book. And I'll just read you from that for a minute. It's called Wordsworth and it takes um, the first line of Wordsworth, a famous poem about daffodils. I wandered lonely as a cloud. And then it has 10 variations on I wandered. So I wandered becomes I wandered, which is a bit homophonic. I wintered, I laundered and so on. Lonely becomes lamely and leanly and so on. As a cloud becomes as a clod and so on. And if you flip the pages, you get slightly, you get a thousand variations of this, which I won't, I'll just read you four or five of them. And so I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lamely as a cloud. I wondered lamely as a cloud. I wondered lamely as a clod. I wintered lamely as a clod. I wintered lamely as a crow. I wintered leanly as a crow. I wintered leanly as a cow. I laundered leanly as a cow. I laundered silent as a cop. And, and so it goes on. But that's an example of this combinatory uh, thing which uh, Ulipo do. And finally 10, because of Ulipo's um, generosity with his ideas, it's gradually becoming quite visible outside Ulipo itself. So Kate Atkinson's novel Life After Life, which explores the different possible lives of a single character and which won the Costa Prize in 2013, is an example of a kind of Ulipian writing and its permutations, as is Tony White's novel The Fountain in the Forest, which came out with Faber in 2018, which is a kind of um, sort of thriller mystery story, doing all the things that that 
kind of genre fiction does in a way, but it also uses in each chapter the answers to a particular Guardian quick crossword. So it has a particular number of words which sort of permutate each chapter and give it a give it a flavour and, and create some of its currents. Um, and like these writers, you're free to do what you like with Ulipo. So why wait? Thank you. <laughs>